Hello, it's time for another Gita video, and uh, today we're doing chapter 5, verses 23 to 26. In the last video, you will recall, it was talking about the importance of being able to achieve totality in all experiences, the good and the bad. And now these verses continue along those lines. So, as usual, we'll read them first. One who is able to tolerate desire and anger, born of lusts, to this very body before it dies, he who can accept it all will find happiness in his humanity. One who has inner happiness, focusing inwardly and enjoying the inner world, he is certainly a mystic. Being aware of the reality of Brahma, he obtains enlightenment in Brahma. Those who are inwardly active achieve enlightenment in Brahma. They are free of any wrongdoing. They have destroyed duality, are focused on the soul, and are doing a service to all living things. Those who are free of desire and anger, and saintly ones who have control of consciousness, the ones who have become aware of the soul, they are assured to gain enlightenment in Brahma. So verse 23 begins this with saying, one who is able to tolerate desire and anger, born of lust, in this very body before it dies, he who can accept it all will find happiness in his humanity. We already heard in the last video that you can't really escape things like desire, anger, or lust. So, the, the term tolerate, desire and anger, born of lust, um, it's suggesting that you are neither fighting it nor clinging to it, right? You're neither being swept away by it nor trying to bury it. This is what was explained in the previous video in this series. If you can do these things, then you find peace. And peace isn't found from running away from anger. Peace is found when you can tolerate anger within yourself without letting it overwhelm you, without trying to rebuke it. And an important part of this line is that it says, in this very body, before it dies. So, you have to be able to accept everything that is within this very body. Right? There's a saying in in Tantric Buddhism, it says, this very body, the Buddha, this very place, the lotus paradise. And then it also says, this very body, the corpse, this very place, the charnel grounds. The charnel grounds is where they go to burn corpses. Um, so what it means is that you have to accept the totality of everything in your experience of living. Right? This body, this yourself, is this super spiritual being, this, this um, ultimate entity, the super, part of the super soul, it's the Buddha, right? And this very place you're in, it, it can be paradise. This also, this body is a corpse. You're a walking corpse. You're doomed to die, right? And this place where you are is where your, your body's going to be burned up one day. So you have to be able to have that level of acceptance, of, a, of, of reaching... Um, an ability to integrate that duality, to and in so doing you annul what is dual about it. And you have to do this within your lifetime. Um, the, the success in, in life from the point of view of enlightenment is that you're able to resolve this separation within yourself and then the separation from yourself to the outside world in, in a lifetime. Because, of course, if you don't, then you're going to be doing it all over again. <laughs> so, if you can 
do this before you die, then you will understand how to be human and you will learn happiness. There's a separate meaning to that too though, right? Is that um, if you can do it in this very body before it dies, because when you die, all dualities are over, right? So doing it before you die means in one sense, you know, get to the work of, of enlightenment. But it's also talking about being able to engage in the mystical experience because that is the mystical experience. It's it's reaching the cessation of duality, which is which inevitably means experiencing death before you die. <clears throat> then you can understand how to be human and then you can find happiness. Because so much of that duality is caused by this division with the desire of not wanting to to experience the, annihil the annihilation of yourself, or, other, or in other words, to put it more, more basically, that you don't want to die. And so if you can die before you die, then you will be able to understand humanity, then you will learn how to be happy. Because right now you're spending a whole lot of your time trying to um, either indulge yourself in things like desire, anger, or lust, or trying to escape things like desire, anger, or lust, in both cases, because you recognize on some conscious or subconscious level your own mortality. And until you resolve the problem of your mortality, then you can't get to the next step. The next step is explained in verse 24. One who has inner, ha inner happiness, focusing inwardly and enjoying the inner world, he is certainly a mystic. So who is a mystic? It's someone who can go within themselves, and within themselves, they find this, this point, which is in the center of themselves, that um, is not affected by the outward forces. And this doesn't mean that a mystic is, just like I said in the, in the previous video, it's not something that a mystic is like this emotionless being that's never happy, never sad, never feels anything. You feel all those things. But there's also something constant within you that is not affected by outer effects. Because all those feelings of happiness, sadness, um, anger, lust, etc., are coming from outside stimuli. But there's something within you that is constant, the superior being that is within yourself. Being aware of the reality of Brahma, he obtains enlightenment in Brahma. Brahma is the, the, the term in the kind of in the Indian mystical context of this um, all-encompassing force, right? Which in um, in other traditions, you could call the Taiji, or you could call it um, the Godhead, or you could call it, uh, you know, the uh, Christ consciousness, or any of there. Are, there are many different terms for it, right? It's the force, right? It's this thing that is that is that is all over us and all around us and within us and without us, and that represents the fact that we are inseparable from our bodies and we are inseparable from our world. Um, and that at the same time, we are not limited by our bodies or not limited by our immediate world, right? That we're a part of something bigger than that because we're, we're inseparable from the universe and we're a part of that universe. And yet we are not just these light beings that, that are temporarily or whatever, you know, the, the, the new age nonsense that says that we're not a part of our bodies and ourselves. That is the part of the universe that we are. So we're obviously a part of that too. Um, it says, those who are inwardly active achieve enlightenment in Brahma. They are free of any wrongdoing. They have destroyed duality, are focused on the soul, and are doing a service to all living beings. Those who are free of desire and anger, the saintly ones who have control of consciousness, the ones who have become aware of the soul, they are assured to gain enlightenment in Brahma. You have to be very careful with these sort of lines, right? Because once you start talking about living saints and things like that, you can get a lot of confusion. And indeed, there are so many supposed living saints, not just Hindu ones or something like that, but in, in just about every tradition that claim to be, you know, the the um, the perfect ones, you know, that that uh, it turns out darn, you know, they don't seem to be to be doing all that much of a service to humanity, right? And um, you have to understand what the contextual definition of this is. Why is it a service to humanity to achieve an enlightened state, right? Why is it a service to humanity to have control over your consciousness? So if you've de defeated duality within yourself, 
Um, only then are you really able to be an a completely integrated part of the universe. Right? If not, you're still constantly struggling with this attempt of separation, of self-withdrawal, of being, um, of trying to, to reference everything to yourself and separate yourself from, from, from the whole. And that means that at, to some extent you are not able, you're not able to be total within yourself and you're not able to be total in your ability to work in the world and to give service to the world. So all living things benefit by being around someone who is whole because someone who is in that state of being whole creates a space for others to be whole in themselves. So the service, the divine service, is when you can create a space to make other people more likely to be able to overcome that rift, that separation between themselves and and the universe, and, and that rift that starts off being about the duality, the division within their own being, between the superior individual and the inferior person, to, you, to borrow the term from, from the I Ching. So anything that you do that helps people to become more conscious, that is service. Anything that you do that, that doesn't help people be more conscious is not service. But not everything that, that, that you do um, that helps people become more conscious will look like you being some kind of a spiritual teacher or something like that. It can have a lot to do with you, with you being around people, with you interacting with people in other ways. It can have to do with stuff with like giving people opportunities in other senses of the word, right? It doesn't mean that everybody has to be to put on monk's robes and... Um, and you know that, or that people who put on monks' robes and get a bunch of you know um, followers and and uh, the, those followers pay money to sit with them in silence. That that isn't necessarily creating any kind of a space, right? Um, first of all, the question is whether that person is actually uh, in any kind of a state to create any kind of a space for anyone else. And second. Um, a lot of times, if the, the point is about venerating how wonderful that, that guru is, then there is an, th that space is not really a space for, for people to make themselves whole, because you make them yourself whole by confronting the duality within yourself. And if people are going to some you know, priest or cleric or imam or, or monk or whatever else um, as a way to escape themselves, then th that's not helping anything, right? So the key here is if you are able to come to terms with that division within yourself, you, you're starting the work of the mystic. Because when you overcome, when you're working at overcoming that division within yourself, I'm not saying you have to do that all first, because that, that's a, a huge project. It's a project of lifetimes, right? But as you're working on that, you begin to develop the understanding of the mystic, which is that there is an, an an unshakable center within yourself that whatever else can be happening, you know, the world can be exploding around you, but there's still one part of you that is that is rooted in this absolute consciousness and that therefore is is um, untouchable. And so if it's untouchable, why would you fear anything that can happen to you in life, right? And if you if you're able to be total because of that, because if you don't fear anything in life, then you can be total. Fear is what stops you from being total. If you can be total, then why would you have to fear death? Because if you've lived a total life, then there's no reason to be worried about, about dying. So this is the path of the mystic. Those are the first, very it put in very layman terms, the steps of the mystical experience. Beyond that, when as you keep developing and deepening your cultivation of that experience, you're able to expand that sort of sense of consciousness to other people, sometimes through literal space, the space around you, the Buddha field, let's call it, sometimes through the way that you're able to talk to them, to show them, to try to help them, um, to recognize how to overcome that duality, which is a tricky thing, because of course, not everybody will understand it in mystics language, and not everybody who speaks mystics language actually wants to do that, right? In fact, the vast majority of people who want to imagine themselves as being spiritual seekers are, well, they are, they're spiritual seekers. They're dedicated to never finding a damn thing. They just want to keep seeking, right? They're dedicated to just 
continuing to, to, to flitter around the world of the spiritual scene without actually accomplishing anything, because accomplishing something would, would defeat their purpose of using this for escapism. So you, um, when, when we're talking about sharing consciousness with people, you have to be able to share it to them at a level in which it'll actually work at getting to them in some way and getting them to recognize where it is that that, that division within themselves is and how to work at overcoming it. So uh, be careful. Be careful if you're thinking, oh, I'm going to share <laughs> consciousness with other people and how you do it. But if you achieve these things, then you end up in this place where you are um, essentially outside of the boundaries of desire and anger, right? Because it's not that you stop experiencing those things. It's that the more you cultivate, the less it matters that you do experience those things. And the more that you're able to retain yourself within consciousness as you experience everything that you experience in life as totally as possible, which is the whole point. Remember, you're not trying to experience less stuff. You're trying to experience everything as completely as you possibly can. And then by becoming more aware of the soul, so to say, of the, of the wholeness of yourself, you are able to gain enlightenment within that, that greater universal soul, which is Brahma. That's everything for the moment. We'll cover the last few verses of this chapter in the next video where, where you get some practical advice. And uh, in the meantime, please subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet, if you've come across this video and you're not a, a subscriber. And feel free to share this video anywhere you like. Um, hit the like button if you can. And if you're interested in getting more uh, of the teachings and not missing any of it, besides being subscribed, you could also sign up to the, um, to the newsletter, the newsletter of the Yifa Society, which has monthly, it's, it's once a month that the newsletter is transmitted. It's completely free and it shares basically the, the um, recent teachings of the past month or so that I may have put out in different social media and sometimes some original material. This last time it went out with some original material that is only for subscribers. And besides that, you, when you subscribe in the subscription email, you will get a link to the PDF of The Path and the Power. The Path of the Power is a, um, tr a, a translation with commentary of the Tao Te Ching, which is a companion volume to my translation with commentary of the I Ching, which is the magician's I Ching. So uh, if you want a free copy of the Path of the Power in PDF, please sign up to, the, to that newsletter. And if you're looking for Actual serious, if you don't want to just be a seeker and you want to be a finder and a, and a, and a cultivator, then uh, take a look at the, uh, in the other videos of the channel, at the playlist of the Yifa Society. And if, if it has an appeal to you and you would like to work in a real program of spiritual cultivation, get in touch with me about applying to the Yifa Society for more serious, intense work with the, the people that are really trying to work this stuff. That's everything for today. Thank you very much.